Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Yeadon and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. We actually have built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration and communication tools for life science companies. We actually help companies vert to virtualize the typical in-person meetings. So we help to virtualize advisory boards, working groups, steering committees, investigator meetings, even doing things like in-house training, corporate meetings, medical education, et cetera. But more importantly, at Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a courageous conversation. And from these big, hairy, audacious conversations, we can work with the provocateurs, the interested healthcare stakeholders, the digital gurus, and the thought leaders that are doing bleeding edge things um, so that we can all collectively work to positively disrupt healthcare. And today, today, I'm really pleased that we have one of these really leading edge thinkers who are going to help us over some of these technology hurdles that we're all facing right now as we're looking at a barrage of digi digitalizations and other rampant accelerated changes in the space that we all live in today. And that is Bryn Williams-Jones. So thrilled to have him. I'm sure you're gonna really equally be intrigued. I couldn't wait for this conversation today. It's going to be really interesting. He's actually the professor and director of the bioethics program at ESPUM and the editor in chief of the Canadian Journal of Bioethics. Um, and he is joining me today for this fireside chat. And uh, so it's, it's super exciting. He's actually the professor and, and, um, and the, the director of the bioethics program, as well as the Department of Social and Preventative Medicine, the School of Public Health at the University of Montreal. He is an interdisciplinary scholar. He's trained in bioethics, and he has a special interest in the socio ethical and policy implications of health innovations in a variety of diverse contexts. And we're gonna dig into a lot of those today. His work examines the conflicts that arise in academic research and professional practice and where the two merge and how do you find that balance. He has a view to developing ethical tools to manage these conflicts when they can't be avoided. And in addition, he also heads the research ethics and integrity group and is the editor in chief of the Open Access Canadian Journal of Bioethics. So welcome, Bryn, so happy to have you on the show today. Thanks, Natalie. It's awesome. So what an interesting career. Um, a lot of us will go to university and not a lot of us will think about a career in bioethics. Now you have you know, high education, master's, PhD in this particular form and in this area. What on earth ever brought you into the space in the first in the first area? My mother was a nurse. And so as a child, she'd come home and at the dinner table, we'd talk about ethical issues that she encountered as a health professional working in a context with elderly people, people uh, dealing with dementia, workplace stress, all the things that we're currently dealing with now because of COVID-19 she was dealing with 20 years ago, not in a pandemic context, but in a context of how do you deal in a careful, ethical, responsible way with people who are dealing with diminished capacities. So those questions got me really angry as a young person thinking about justice and problems with the health system. And that's how I got into bioethics. I did a, ma a bachelor's degree in philosophy because I needed the conceptual tools. And then I had experiences in social sciences and I worked in the ethics of genetics and health policy and all along always thinking about those questions of justice. How do we ensure that health innovations go to people who need them and are made accessible? How do we ensure that health professionals don't get burned out by being inundated by policy changes or by requirements that go over their ability as health professionals. Those are all the sorts of ethical issues that I was dealing with as a 20 year old and that I've spent my career expanding on. And then also always bringing in that question of ethics and technology. Where does technology fit? Where is it a possible solution? And where is it a cause of the problem? 
Fascinating, Bryn. And I'm sure that the topics at your at the dinner table as a young person are probably were very unique and different. So we are very lucky to have have had those conversations to bring you to the table today. So we have a lot to cover today, and I have so many different angles. So I'm going to try to direct this conversation because there's so many juicy components to this. Obviously, being in the brink of the second wave of the pandemic. We're all going into lockdown. Everybody's worried about cases and hospitalizations and deaths. All of this right before major festivities and you know important seasonal times, you know Black Fridays and shopping and Thanksgiving in the U.S. and then obviously Christmas for everyone else, at least in North America, um, and who, and people who follow that faith. But it is truly a unique and different time. So right now, as we know, when the first wave hit, when we talk, when we go way back to the time of, you know, March, April, when things were just locking down, we saw that there was an immediate effect on patients, on physicians, clinical trials, everything literally stopped. We'd never seen anything like it. And we saw this starting of, you know, well, people still need to be seen. People still have health conditions. People still need to be managed with their prescriptions and their, their diagnoses, et cetera. And it became almost like a rebirth of telehealth, which was the technology that existed for years and years, but only sort of had a revival, which was almost like a forcing of the hand since the pandemic acted like an accelerant. So as we just take a few minutes to look at the ethics around telemedicine, telehealth, in the context of a digital divide, the haves and the have nots, the people who have access to computers, to broadband, to the right kinds of communities with infrastructure. Can you speak a little bit around those components and how you see things? You really name some key issues there that were striking as a university professor because I switched immediately into online teaching and I was really pleasantly surprised to see how quickly as a society our universities, the healthcare sector, were able to mobilize these digital technologies and to get everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people very quickly online. Now, huge learning curve, but the, what it demonstrated was in a context of a crisis, we were able to ramp forward technologies that had been taking years to get rolled out and literally get them rolled out in weeks. I, insane. Now, that's the really upside, right? Where suddenly we're connected, we're reducing all sorts of digital divides because people who never would have had access suddenly have access. You and I are now having a dialogue and sharing this with literally the world. Six months ago, this wasn't happening. We weren't doing this and it's now happening all the time. What that presumes though, is that people have internet connections with sufficiently high bandwidth so that they can follow their course or that they can meet their physician online and get connected and that they can do it. We know that in Canada, even in you know, rural uh, Canada or not even so far rural parts of Toronto, parts of Montreal don't have sufficiently good bandwidth for people who live there to be able to do a virtual connection with their physician. Never mind sit in a two hour Zoom in a university course. So that's a really big problem. And the issue gets loaded onto the shoulder of the individual, which creates an injustice because it doesn't matter whether I'm willing to pay more money if there's no access in my neighborhood. So you have some people who just don't have the ability. That's one issue. And then the responsibility has to get pushed up at another level because it's an infrastructure problem. It's a collective action problem. If we download responsibility onto us as individual citizens, well, then we end up failing because we don't have the means. Because the problem is an infrastructure problem, it's a collective problem, and that's where government needs to intervene. But you also have to think about those other aspects of the digital divide. It's not just about capacity, it's also about ability. So are the people who are expected now to do online communication familiar with the technology? People who may not speak English or French, people who may be elderly, or who may not have access to computers. Yeah, there's internet in the neighborhood, but there's one laptop for the entire family. How do you have a private conversation about a sensitive health issue when you're in a small apartment with three or four other people? 
So you've got privacy issues, you've got capacity to mobilize technology, and that's just on the side of the user. Same thing for the health professional. Do they have the infrastructure? Do they have the training? All of those issues had to be dealt with. And then another one that became a huge challenge for health professionals, and I've talked to many of them, and here's a plug for my journal, our December issue, there's an article about the ethics of virtual health. And one of the challenges that they raise is the data privacy issues. If it's the responsibility of the clinical provider to manage that interaction, they're also responsible for the management of the data. What happens if they get hacked? What happens if they don't have good IP support, good IT support? If they don't have that infrastructure, then they're part of the problem instead of being the solution. So you've got multiple issues just around how we do telehealth. It could be great, but if we haven't thought about the possible inequalities, we then reinforce those existing social inequalities. So who should be at the table to be changing policy and legislation? You do see some government officials who are on Twitter and LinkedIn talking about things like the digital charter and what it means to share versus not share and what your rights are versus not. And we're having a whole discourse on the idea behind sharing and what's personal and what's shareable and kind of changing the mindset and the belief systems around this. There is a need for policy change and also for a change in belief systems around there maybe perhaps in the future, there's a different definition of privacy. What do you, what's your thoughts around what that looks like in the future? We need to be having a conversation about what information is sufficiently personal that we want to keep it private and why privacy is an important protection. So right now we hear a lot about the fact that, oh, you know, teenagers have no worries about sharing all their information on Twitter or on Facebook or uh, what have you, as if that's a justification for uh, an open buffet and that you can take everything. The problem is people can share information without knowing that it is now posing risks for them. So we see the use of digital mining technologies to get and develop individualized profiles on consumers that then gets used against them when they're applying for health insurance or for a job. Oh, so you actually said some really nasty things about your former employer. And this is now all available and there's a dossier on you and it's not being held against you. So a conversation that you had in what you thought was a private space is being used against you for other means. And you're not aware of that. Those are real problems. Uh, how does it get used to disempower certain people? Does it reinforce uh, racism, uh, social isolation, different types of discrimination? That's hugely problematic. If we're not being aware of how personal information can be, be used either for good or for bad. So we need to be much more clear about that. And there's gradation. So we need to be thinking what sort of information. There's a big difference between general metadata and very individualized things like a, 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 you know, a personal insurance number or a credit card number. They have different levels of risk. And so you have to manage those accordingly. And there's different responsibilities to whoever's handling that information. So whether it's a bank or whether it's a health professional, they've got to be very sensitive about that information. And they don't always have the ability. So I've heard stories talking to clinicians where the data that they thought was in a confidential patient record was actually being mined by an IT company to then sell that to a pharmaceutical industry to do direct advertising back to the clinician to help them target particular drugs to a patient. They completely freaked out because they wow. didn't realize that that data was being used to influence their behavior as a clinician. We've got to have that conversation. And that's a public conversation. It can't just be me as an academic talking to a physician. It's got to be part of an open discourse around what's the sort of digital society we want to live in. Love it. And I'm so glad that we are starting that conversation. It's timely. It's important. It's, and it's going to be something that um, is going to take years to, to have, but at least we're starting it. So absolutely essential. And so this is part of the silver lining, I think, of this pandemic is it's opened the doors to these conversations, these ones that really help to disrupt some of the status quo and the thinking and the lethargy and the inertia 
that has prevented us from doing and being and, and being the change that we want to see. So this actually leads me, of course, COVID-19 um, brings up all kinds of other issues around, also around the ethics around personal freedoms. And we've seen that unfortunately, the concept of mask wearing has been weaponized and politicized, obviously, you know, to a large degree south of the border um, and our friends uh, south of us. But tell us a little bit about your thoughts around the mask wearing and the representation and how this fares for people's legal and ethical rights as being free citizens. So in the context of a pandemic, we're immediately forced to confront the limits of our individual liberties and the recognition that there are lots of things that we can't do by ourselves. The response has to be collective. That's the nature of public health. And public health is aiming at not the patient, but at the population. So it's there to protect us all collectively. The interventions are populational. So it's groups or entire populations. It's also operating in a context of uncertainty. So at the beginning of the crisis, we didn't really know about the efficacy of masks. Uh, we didn't know how this virus was circulating. Was it like influenza? Was it super uh, infectious like the common cold? How was it working? And the downside of that is we saw lots of ambivalence on the part of our public health officials and politicians around, should we wear masks? Are oh, we not so sure? Uh, it's, it's not that big a deal. The problem with that was it created uncertainty. And then when we moved towards, okay, we've got now clear recommendations, everybody should be wearing masks in these contexts and here's why, you have to then get over that bubble of uncertainty because that information wasn't available. Now you deal with that by actually being a lot more honest. And where I've critiqued our uh, health decision makers is being around a lack of transparency on what they know and what they don't know. By being more honest to citizens with scientific uncertainty, it enables to build trust in saying, here's what we do know, and here's what we don't know, but we're working at it. We're doing research. And as we know more, well, we'll change decisions in light of the best evidence that's available. But that best evidence is always a shifting target. And that's normal. That's science. That's how health gets done. So in that context, you build trust by being honest. With the masks, you know, we're now hitting a stage in Canada where adoption is pretty strong. But we're also having to ask questions, do we now start imposing it and making fines? Because there are some people who are just completely refractory to the standard guidance that's available right now. And we know the mask is not the only solution. The vaccine will not be the only solution. Physical distancing, it, it has to be a multi-level approach. I, I read an article yesterday that was saying, we need the Swiss cheese approach, which is multiple holes, and the virus doesn't get through because it's hitting multiple layers of protections. Each single layer is insufficient. Together, you now have something that will enable us to get out of this crisis, hopefully in the next year or two. But we still have a long way ahead. And so we've got to get over that COVID fatigue of we really want to get together with our family and friends and socialize. And are we going to really imagine that we're gonna have a party with 10 people at Christmas and everybody's gonna bring their own dinner and their own cutlery and they're, they're gonna be wearing face masks. No, of course not. There's a calculated risk happening, but we also have yeah. to be cognizant of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you bring up something that's so important and underlying all of this uncertainty. And that is, I think we have revealed in the general population, the, um, the insane desire for precision in you know a bottom line so a mathematical approach to everything and what we have served let me, let me interrupt you there um i'm not sure that it's a desire from the public i think it's something we've been sold it's a message that's being pushed by uh, opinion leaders uh, and by government that trust us we know everything which is impossible the you know the basics of science is uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty, which is why we do research, right? We want to understand things. This is a good thing. So the, I think the public actually is much more cognizant of the fact that we're dealing with uncertainty because that's the human condition. We're always living in context where we don't know everything. 
Which I actually, I actually agree with you there because I think when a lot of times you listen to these news presentations with the premier standing up and yeah, going on, exactly. what you are seeing is probably people having been spoon fed for so many years because you're having them constantly looking for the isolated. This is this that you know they're looking to get rid of their cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. and getting rid of the sense of ambiguity that makes people feel so uncomfortable. This per, you know this province is doing this. These provinces, these states are doing this. Why is everything different? And they're having a very difficult time being able to rely on judgment and personal, um, you know, uh, understanding. Um, and basically, like I said, personal judgments on what they should be doing and how they should be acting. And so I think it's a very interesting world that we live in right now where we're looking or expecting certainty from organizations where there just isn't. And the flip is those organizations are not always doing what they should be doing to build that certainty because when one week we're doing x and the next week we're doing y and we're looking at y and going okay wait you're you're blocking some sorts of get-togethers but you're allowing the restaurant to stay open or the movie theater or the religious uh institution but you're not allowing us to have a group of 10 wait you don't have to be a phd to recognize that there are huge incoherencies and that's where you the in reasonable people are saying yeah, we're not doing this for public health reasons. We're doing this for economic reasons and particular types of ideology. That then undermines the trust in that public health message. Instead of being much more honest about what are all the pieces that go into the calculation, recognizing that, yeah, we could shut everything down, but that may be so costly that we can't accept that. Although we're now starting to see people raise that flag and say, maybe what we need is a short, sharp shutdown so we can get back going again in two weeks or three weeks instead of being shut down for two months because we don't want to go there again but we may have absolutely. to because things are out of control yeah absolutely and there's a lot that i can go in different variety of areas there i know that you've also been working on a task force or the national task force on contact tracing which was an interesting experiment in itself you have you heard a lot about it at the beginning and then it kind of died and then we don't really know what happened to it some provinces took it on Others like Quebec just never associated with it. And this general population distrust of governments, of agencies, of concerns of fake news and pseudoscience, and you know, and the conflict that are going on because of that, it makes one ask the question of, you know, what is going on with these kinds of apps in the future? Are people distrustful of what they're doing with their data? And then it starts to ask these questions about their uncertainty around the vaccine that's going to be coming forward. Is the science solid? We're hearing this whole thing about the AstraZeneca, about some weird effects of, you know, you're a certain dose at 70% effectiveness. And then when you half the dose and give it twice, it's now 90%. People don't know what to believe, how they're going to be getting things. How do you speak to people's um, level of disease and how that translated into the lack of national uptake of something as, as straightforward as things like a contact tracing app? Well, again, it comes down to, what is the solution? So part of the problem that we saw with the rollout of the different contact tracing apps is it wasn't clear that it actually was the right solution because they weren't doing contact tracing. What they were doing, you know, the models that we were seeing are essentially self-identification. And that is adding a significant burden on the person to, you know, give that information back. But that, predis that, that presumes that you have access to testing. So I, I, I've got the app on my phone, but it's actually hard to get testing and we don't have widespread access to rapid testing with quick turnaround. So that you see the systemic issues. And it also raises the concern of why are we investing in this technological approach? Is this a bit, you know, a, a little bit like magic, you know, wave the shiny hand over here. So you don't notice the fact that our public health professionals are doing contact tracing using fax machines. I mean, come on, <laughs> hang on a second. This makes no sense. What it speaks to is a complete disinvestment by generations of political governments in public health, which was so essential. They need computers and they need personnel and they need the tools to do classic contact tracing, which is people with telephones calling other people. And it works. And this is what we saw in Asia. It's what we've seen in Australia and New Zealand. They've mobilized the public health infrastructure to actually get people to have access to testing quickly. If you have to get your test and then wait 10 days, that makes no sense. 
it's, I mean, you've completely defeated the purpose. An application on a phone is not gonna make any different if I'm still waiting a week to get the data. That's, that's just crazy. So those are parts of the problems. The other is these technologies are always socially embedded. So it arises in a context where people are legitimately concerned about their metadata being vacuumed up by the GAFAs, you know, Apple, uh, Google, et cetera. And we know we're being manipulated by this stuff. So do I really trust the end user not to be using it against me? That's part of that concern, which I think has some explanation for why people haven't bought into it. But it also is we haven't been convinced that it's actually going to make a difference because what we know we need is immediate testing and those other precautionary mechanisms, but they're not available yet. That's what's missing. It's we're missing the basic stuff. So the technology looks like a simple quick fix, but people aren't dupes. They're, they can understand that that's probably not what we need. We need something else. I think it's fascinating. And I, I really do appreciate the positivity that you have towards population intelligence and that, you know, you're giving kudos to the group that people are smarter than I think sometimes governments oh, definitely. make people out to be. So people, that's I absolutely mean, fantastic. People, I just kind of you wanna... don't need a PhD to understand the basic issues. You can explain to people, and this is what journalists do so well. And I, I, whenever I work with journalists, I thank them for their work in making that information accessible to the public because it's essential so that we stay informed and so that we're not manipulated by fake news. It's that collective critical thinking. It is possible. We're doing it. We just need to keep doing it. Absolutely. We're in a place right now where we're in this, we're in this uh, place where we want to start doing, we're, we're, we're trying to balance, and I feel sorry a lot for these, you know, public health um, physicians, premier, you know, it's a difficult, thankless job. There's nothing that you're going to do that's right. On the one hand, you're getting pushed by healthcare professionals, they're getting inundated ICUs, hospitalizations, and then the other side, you're actually having teary-eyed small business owners who really are terrified of lockdowns and basically losing their bread and butter. So we have to find this balance between economics and healthcare. And so the question comes down to is, how do we do this knowing that we're affecting A, people's you know, economics and, and social ability to be able to you know, maintain what they're doing and also the mental health of society and, and, and what's going on there. So, and keeping in mind that in amidst all of this is that we, you know, we have to actually get people's data through all of this. And so there's kind of, to be able to do precision lockdowns, we need to have the appropriate amount of information. Who are the populations that are at higher risk? Should there be specific geographic areas? Um, I saw I read, uh, saw something recently on Bloomberg with the CEO from 23andMe where they were seeing that there's certain genetics with certain um, ethnic groups that might be a, have a pro higher um, proclivity to getting COVID-19. But then the question comes down to the ethics of identifying these demographics, mm -hmm. applying it, and then people having concerns about it being applied inconsistently and you know with prejudice. So I'm just curious if you can speak to this as the, the balancing of e economics with health, and then how do we leverage this sensitive data so that we could potentially do these longer term lockdowns in a more forensic way. So two excellent points that are separate but interlinked. So I would say the first one is about procedure. One of the big challenges is actually getting everybody, all the key stakeholders. So yes, decision makers, yes, experts, health professionals, associations, but the economic sector, the different industry groups around high level policy tables where you sit down and you say, what's the best way to proceed? So if you just have one group making decisions, you don't have the social acceptability. We accept that we're in a situation where hard decisions have to be made and not everybody is gonna be happy with it. That's inevitable because it's a complex situation that's requiring very costly, expensive in all the senses uh, impact on people. So you deal with that by having an open, reasoned discussion. And you do that by getting all the reasonable arguments around the table and leveled in a very transparent manner where everybody's actually listening to each other. It's procedural justice. 
you do that and you do it transparently and you do it with recurrent timelines where you say, okay, every two months, we're gonna evaluate whether there's new information and whether we need to change practices. You do that sort of continual evaluation and that's how you do good ongoing policy in a context that's inevitably shifting because the social context has changed. There are new technologies that are coming available. There may be a vaccine coming down the line, but who knows how effective it's gonna be. Now that then brings to the second point, which is how do you measure that efficacy? This is what my colleagues in epidemiology and public health do. It's getting as much data as you can, but you gotta have the right data. You gotta get it in a timely manner. The data has gotta be trustworthy. It's gotta be good quality. So those are challenging issues as well. Garbage in, garbage out. If you got bad data, you make bad decisions. So you need to create systems that incentivize the right actors to provide that data. Part of that is us as citizens being convinced that sharing some of our personal information is part of a collective response to a collective problem. That's part of it. But then you do that by saying, and this information will be taken care of in a trustworthy way. Here are the trusted organizations who will protect it. Yes, there's always a risk of a data breach, but here's everything we put in place to ensure that that is the least likely possible. And here's what we would do if it happens. We can do this, right? It's, this is not rocket science. It's complicated, but it can get done. And that allows us to move forward. But it also has to be careful and say, what do we actually need to make reasoned decisions? The danger is take everything. Well, if you take all the data and we're now in a full surveillance society, you then do other things that are destructive to what we want as a society. We don't want to lose those civil liberties. We don't want to feel like we're being manipulated all the time because that's an important part of the way we live in the society we want to live in. But we also want to be able to trust that when we contribute to something, it will be in the collective interest, not just, oh, this is good for bread or this is good for somebody else. No, it's good for all of us, but that can be done. And it requires mobilizing the expertise and the expertise is there. What I see in some of the challenges is the expertise is siloed. There's stuff happening in the universities, there's stuff happening in government, there's stuff happening in different professional associations, and they're not really working together because they're still operating as if each one has the solution. The solution is getting all these people around the table and sharing a common vision and building that and agreeing to disagree sometimes, but still moving forward. Absolutely. And talking about agreeing to agree or disagree is we're also seeing a lot, and again, COVID-19 has been a magnifying glass for this, in the processes and the methodologies for doing things like drug discovery, identification, approvals. We're thinking about the speed at which FDA versus Health Canada versus other agencies across the globe, NIH, et cetera. And it's, it, and it's, and it's put on the magnifying glass about the process and the time it takes to do this and the urgency. And now suddenly we've got uh, you know, the, the world looking in, you know, and, and watching everything that they're doing. So there's been a, a little bit of a protection, if you will, of these, you know, uh, these organizations, they've been protected by government, they go at their own pace, they work at government speed. And so the question comes down to is the speed at which they've been or going to be approving vaccines. It does beg the question about future discovery and approvals in the future and the potential disparity in injustices of how certain drugs are approved in the US or globally and that are not even available or accessible in Canada um, for a myriad of different reasons. So not only from a regulatory approval, but also in terms of a market access and reimbursement by either public or private payers. We're now shining the light on these, these inadequacies um, these you know, organizations that have their own methodologies that might not be as up to speed or they're very slow or inertial. What do you have to say around the ethics of how we're conducting um, our regulatory market access approvals? So there's two parts to that answer. One of it is the upstream, how do we do the research? And the other is the downstream, how do we decide what we put onto the market and what follow on we do? but the two are intimately connected. So the upstream stuff is classic research ethics, which gets problematic in a context of a crisis because 
there's enormous pressures to move things forward very quickly, to combine phase one, phase two clinical trials, to push through a phase three when you have relatively small sample sets, to push very quickly through to regulation when you still haven't really got all the evidence that you need. And sometimes it, with a lack of transparency beyond just the regulators. So what we're seeing with vaccine development, huge push. I mean, literally never seen this before. We've never been in a context where there would be literally hundreds of vaccines in development and you know five or 10 hitting the marketplace simultaneously. This is incredible because of a huge amount of interest for a massive global public health problem. So great. The danger though is if we jump steps too quickly and don't have the reliable data, well then we'll run to market with something that will actually prove to be less effective than we think it is. It looks great, but then when we start rolling it out into the sufficiently large population sizes, we see risks that we didn't know about. Or it doesn't last as long as we think it was going to. Uh, it's less effective in some populations compared to others, which then gets you to that second stage of how do we make these technologies available? What we've seen in North America and Europe is vaccine nationalism. We're gonna buy up stocks because we're gonna protect our people. But we're in a global pandemic and we have international travel. So what about Africa? What about Latin America? What about all those poor countries who don't have the billions of dollars to buy these vaccines and who need them as well? Because if we don't get our stuff together globally, well, the problem is still there we think we're, okay, everything's great. All the Canadians be vaccinated, we're fine. But we're still in a global context. If we want to open our borders again and the rest of the world isn't vaccinated, we're still dealing with the same problem. So that's part of an issue. Then there's also the follow-on. Are we ensuring that we've got the phase four post-marketing studies that are well-established and that have the digital platforms so that when there are secondary effects, because it'll happen, that they get identified appropriately by people who are affected, that they can feed it back to the regulator via their clinician, so that all that information gets channeled back to then have a continuous learning system that we're advancing, we're developing new knowledge, and that we can take a pause and say, yeah, that's not as working as well as we thought. Let's look at this other one that seems to be working better and has less side effects. You need that information, but you need systems that are robust and that are reliable and that ensure that good information is coming in because that'll allow good decisions to happen. Bad information, bad decisions. So the two are connected. The danger is if we do things too fast because we're in, in a hurry and if we don't have in the follow-on mechanisms to ensure the rollout is effective. You also need that good data to know, is it cost-effective? Is this something that the federal government should approve and thus the public should have trust in. If it gets rolled out too quickly uh, and then it blows up, then we lose trust. That's extremely damaging. That's something we want to avoid. When, so you bring up so many important points there, honestly, that each one of them is their own show. But so we're, we're right in this middle of this, you know, whole supply chain, looking at the execution of how this is going to get rolled out in Canada, the US and other big countries and, you know, obviously globally. Um, but the question comes down to the ethics of the dis dissemination. We're already hearing about three products. We're probably going to be hearing about five, 10, 20, very, very shortly. So the question comes down to is who gets what? Mm -hmm. What is it going to be based on? Is it going to be based? I mean, we were already talking about echelons around the most vulnerable, et cetera. And these people need fridges and these people don't. But what what is underlying all of this and what is some of the ethical dilemma behind vaccine uh, dissemination? So it's fundamentally a justice issue, but the justice isn't just, oh, that's just. It's a whole set of principles below that. So you got to look at the efficacy of this vaccine, vaccine X. Who does it work best for? And do we have the capacity to roll out? If it works really well with elderly people, but you need fridges that go down to minus 80, that limits its functionality to some environments. It's gonna be completely useless probably in developing countries where they don't have the infrastructure. So maybe there's another vaccine that doesn't have the same profile that works better in that context. So you've got an efficacy issue. But the other one is, okay, 
take any vaccine. We've got the capacity in Canada to roll it out. How do we roll it out first? Well, there, the, again, a couple of different issues. So it's not just the sickest first, that's one principle, but it's also the health professionals first and the frontline workers, because if they get sick, then everything else falls down. So you can very reasonably and ethically justify treating the sickest first, uh, vulnerable groups who may be more likely to spread disease and not see it. So you could make an argument to say, we need to vaccine the, vaccinate the teenagers and the 20-somethings because they're less likely to get ill, but they're maybe at a higher risk of spreading the disease. So as a prevention, which is different from protecting elderly people who are at risk of dying, which is different from protecting the health professionals to make sure that they don't get sick, their families don't get sick, so they can keep doing their jobs. All of them go together and they all fit into an ethical calculus that all the decision-making groups, the Health Canada, provincial bodies are, are rolling out as they're thinking about how to prioritize access immediately and over coming months. But then you have the longer term ones of what are we going to do for Africa? Are we going to, you know, say we've got the capacity, we've got extra, we're going to ship it over there. Or it's uh, the, I think it's the Oxford one where they're saying, hey, this is actually designed to be cheap, easily affordable. And the, the goal is not the first world, it's the developing world. So there are different strategies. The advantage that we have right now, and, and this is where I put on my positive ethicist hat, which is there's so many different possibilities. It gives us much more choice and much more capacity to reach a global audience with a diversity of needs because there's no magical bullet that's gonna be perk for everybody. There's too many variables, but that's a good thing because it means that we're much more likely to be able to respond to those differences and not reinforce more than is likely anyway, existing social injustices. We're um, going to be in the predicament that we're in. A lot of people are predicting for at least the next year before people are even remotely starting to feel like they can start doing anything kind of semi-normal. Um, if that, probably two years. In the meantime, things like telehealth and other sorts of use of digital therapeutics. We're hearing about digital biomarkers using digital avatars for clinical studies, sensors, wearables. Um, and all of this is really asking those ethical questions. We talked a little bit about this at the beginning of this session around data and you know data security and where is these you know these data lakes and who has access to refining these data lakes and accessing it um where are we on this are we ever going to go back is this going to be the new normal of a patient centric uh reality as it as it applies to drug discovery as it applies to diagnosis of conditions and to the management of people's health conditions i think we're hitting a almost a turning point in terms of what's possible because the digital technologies have demonstrated their efficacy. And we've seen that we're able to shift very quickly to collecting data that can improve the delivery of care, that can give better information to clinicians so they make more informed decisions with their patients so that health providers and systems can better do their jobs. So that's a good thing. But we also have to be very cognizant that when there's lots of different systems and that are competing systems happening simultaneously, you can then have conflict between what's the best way to do things. So there's lots of harmonization that needs to get done. You need lots of talking between expert bodies. You need review panels that look at a range of possibilities and say, okay, here's five different solutions. Which one actually works best? So that's why we have health agencies. That's why we have uh, expert committees that do these analyses. We need to do this in a logic of continuous learning. So we recognize that we're rolling out changes, but let's think about the costs. So we've shifted all our clinicians to primarily working from home. You know, that creates a huge benefits to see populations who never would have been seen before because of distance issues. So they couldn't get to a major metropolitan center to visit their clinician. This is amazing now. You can reach populations who were completely inaccessible to healthcare. But you also now have clinicians who are spending their days in front of the computer screens. What are they not seeing that they would have seen in a face-to-face -face exchange? So I'm a university teacher. Uh, a group of 10 people, that's great. But there's still the body language that I'm not seeing. But when there's a group of 60, we're not seeing any body language. 
So those sorts of issues have to come into our thinking as well. What is good about digital interaction and what are its weaknesses? And then adjust that. I think we're gonna see a move towards much more working from home. What we haven't talked about a lot of, which we were talking about enormously before COVID with the environment. We're not talking about the massive use of data and the impact on all the servers and all the greenhouse gases that are being generated by all those computers running our video talks. That's hugely data intensive. We need to be thinking about all the environmental impact of this situation, particularly as we move all completely online over the next year or two. So those have to come into our reflection. How can we make these you know, data uh, environments much more green? So it's energy sources, but then it's also efficiencies. So there's lots of possibilities and there's huge opportunities for tech companies, for innovators to think creatively and come up with solutions because this is the beauty of a crisis. It's when humanity is confronted with a challenge. It's when we see the radical ideas come up and we see opportunities. We see solutions that we never would have thought about because we were doing it the old fashioned way. We're now confronted with a, an opportunity and everything's open. So let's capitalize on that creativity that's incredibly widespread and mobilize it, but also ensure that our systems can take on that creativity and say, okay, that's a good one. Let's run with that and see where it goes. I love the systems thinking and the, system, the innovation systems thinking, which is very different than just taking small little building blocks and working on them um, on their own because they're all all holistically connected, which I think you've illustrated beautifully. Now, part of this sort of digital ecosystem that we're finding ourselves um, more and more integrated with is based on algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. A whole series of way that, ways that they're done. You've actually alluded to this earlier about around the ethics and the concerns about who is ultimately accountable and responsible for decisions for outcomes and for impact. So the question comes down to is, how do we deal with the intrinsic issues with algorithms such as in, intrinsic bias, reduction of diversity and mistakes that might happen as a result? Who ultimately is accountable for those? Can you speak to some of those issues? So the issues around AI, at multiple levels. The big talking point, I'm seeing this in all the conferences, is bias. But it's about how you detect bias and how you avoid bias and how you build in systems to continually be self-aware of the risk of bias. So you can take a learning system, you can feed it biased information, but you could also build a learning system to be self-aware that it's getting biased information. So those are possibilities. You build engines that are capable of being much more critical. You also train the engineers. So I've done training sessions to engineers. I, I'm looking at a bunch of white men in the audience and saying, uh, there are no women of color in this group. I'm a, a white man as well. So, and you name that to engineers and the response is, oh yeah, that's a problem. Let's fix it. <laughs> the beauty about working with engineers is they're problem oriented. If you name a problem, they see the problem, they wanna find a solution. So you think about, Okay, so there's a problem with the data that's coming in. How do we expand our data sets so that they're much more representative of the people and the environments in which we want to work? So that changes again the way you're thinking. Instead of going, oh, that's the easy data sets because we have access to rich data. Well, maybe there's diverse data sets that are not as rich, but they're actually getting at something that we were missing, which was the diversity. Because the last thing we want is the algorithm, I think this was at Amazon, where they kept hiring white men because the algorithm was based on a hiring of white men. And so it was systematically excluding women, uh, minority communities, uh, disabled people, et cetera, because it was already part of a biased system, which is the societies that we live in. Our societies have intrinsic system systemic bias. So you teach the system to be aware of that. You build in explicit ethical principles and you name those. So you name top level principles. Uh, the Montreal Declaration is one of many but then you also operationalize them. That's when it comes harder. And that's why, you know, 
applied ethicists like myself are working with teams of graduate students and other colleagues to try and operationalize that. So the engineer has got something better than a high level principles, but it's got you know, a decision tree to think through and analyze what they're working on, ask the right questions and then find the solutions. Cause it's not good enough to say, let's think about justice. <laughs> no, we need the, okay, how do I analyze it as I'm dealing with this? Another one you raised was the information sources. So I'm uh, working on a grant application right now to try and build satirical bots to fake media influencers because these things exist. We know the fake media is being generated by intelligent agents that are learning and that are extremely difficult, if not impossible for people to detect. We want to fight that as a way to generate critical abilities on the part of our fellow citizens to better identify what's fake media and what's real and trustworthy. And we want to do it in a satirical fashion. We don't want to say, you bad people. We want to say, hey, look, this is a caricature. This is a satire, but it's a way of learning to recognize rhetoric, to recognize manipulative strategies, to help our fellow citizens develop those critical thinking skills that are so essential in an incredibly complex media environment where we can't tell that Bryn is actually Bryn and not some artificial avatar. We need those skills, but then we also need the technology response, which is the AI that is designed to fake it so that it can be a better detector. And so that becomes then a tool for us to recognize that, ah, that site, that's not too credible uh, because my AI bot just flagged it as a high risk site. Those are useful so, tools that we need. Yeah, it's a very interesting. I just um, read a book by Nina Schick called Deep Fakes. Um, and really interesting about what you're talking about, the idea of bad synthetic media. What is this going to look like in the future? We're already sort of hinging on that potential reality of, you know, this whole presidential election just happened. It was hinging on this whole concept of what's real and what's not. How how can two completely different views on the same thing actually happen? It's, it's like people have different versions of reality or truth. And this is happening right in front of us. And so this actually speaks also to pseudoscience. What is real? What is truth? Um, what do I believe in? And so this is actually bringing up a whole can of worms that we're all going to have to work through. And what that speaks to is the importance of having these discussions, but also not slipping into, oh, they're a bunch of just crazy people. But recognize, no, they're our fellow citizens. So how do we empower them to develop those skills? And some of the literature that I'm seeing says, well, look, if you blame people, you just get their backs up. Whereas if you show them that they're actually being manipulated and what are the rhetorical tools that are being used to manipulate them, you then give them the possibility to say, oh, I don't like that. I don't like being manipulated. Now I'm better aware of how I'm being manipulated. And maybe that'll help me get out of listening to that sort of media and look at other sorts of sources and why they're more reliable. But it's also valorizing the role of experts, of decision makers, as I was saying at the beginning of our talk, being more transparent about what they know and what they don't know. The danger is when you have the completely packaged idea that's simple, that's emotional, that doesn't require thinking. That's extremely dangerous because the human reality is one of complexity, is one of uncertainty. It's that's life, but we got to get on and deal with it. Absolutely. We've actually, there are so many interesting ethical dilemmas. We spent a lot of time talking about, you know, the ones that relate specifically to COVID-19 and healthcare, which is, you know, a big area that we fit, fit into. But, you know, certainly there's all kinds of things going on in society today. One of them is, you know, the disparity, for example, in the economics, which is the disparity between Wall Street and Main Street mm -hmm. and what's going on there. The disparity in wealth uh, of that, that's happening. Um, issues about what the new workforce is going to look like. You know, is a physician going to become a data scientist in the future? We no longer need these empathetic individuals, or is that what the role is? What do we um, do with it, all the truck drivers when we automate fleets of vehicles and there's no room for those people? How do you retrain somebody who's 50 years old and doesn't have a university education? We just heard recently today that Loblaws, you know, one of the biggest supermarkets in Canada, are going to be doing these kind of driverless trucks to you know, hit you know, the delivery between warehouses and their stores. And so where does all this go? So there's gonna be a displacement of mm -hmm. humanity. Where does universal basic income come into this? 
where does the individual come in? I mean, this is, like I said, it's probably a segue to a whole other discussion. Um, it really asks the question is, what does it mean to be human in this world today? And what society do we want to live in? And that has to be, I would say both of these questions are, they're fundamental philosophical questions, but they're very real human questions about how do we want to live? And they're questions that we need to keep asking because the response is not in one answer. It's in a process where we continually imagine a future that we want to have, and we imagine the futures that we don't want to have. And that sort of science fiction reflection is useful because it allows us to say, we don't want to go there, we want to go there. And let's try and collectively identify where there is. And there, and there could be a possibility that you could see a split, if not into my major splinter groups, where you have the Elon Musk followers who do believe in the world living in Mars and who do believe in being a cyborg and getting neural link implanted into your cerebrum and, and becoming you know, part of the collective consciousness and moving away from the rest of humanity while everybody else you know, disagrees with that. And so I think it's gonna be a very interesting trajectory about what happens with humanity moving forward. So as we approach the top of the hour, again, this is a fascinating topic. I could like talk about this for hours is um, what is next for you? I mean, there are so many different roads you can go down and probably sure you wake up every day and try to figure out which, which project you're gonna work on. Um, but what is some of these big nuggets that you're planning to, to, um, to spearhead? My priorities now are really around developing tools, helping health professionals, helping citizens have concrete tools to apply complex theory, uh, philosophy, big level principles, the hard stuff into real world objects. You know, I would, I, I love working with my graduate students uh, and colleagues uh, in IT, uh, in the AI sector, in health professions to think about the challenge they're dealing with now. And then my job is, okay, let's name the challenge, let's identify a solution, and then let's figure out how to make that solution happen. So it's really that applied ethics aspect in general. And the crazier the idea, the more I'm happy to support it. Uh, <laughs> and part of it is about that outreach. So it's working with the media, but it's also creating opportunities to organize events like we're having today to expand our, our thinking to a broad audience, to give people the tools to better ask the questions of their family, of their colleagues, of their decision makers, so they become more empowered citizens. Those it's are the sorts of projects I want to do. I love it, and it, it's fascinating work. And you're probably such a huge, we're gonna have such a huge impact in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Um, for those of you who are not getting a chance of, until to listen to this till later, we are going to be putting a link to Bryn. So in case anybody wants to speak with him, to partner, to find out more about what him, he, and his group is doing, and also would uh, recommend that you check out ImpetusDigital.com. Um, we actually are, through our Insight platform, we actually help to have these big, hairy, audacious conversations through synchronous touch points like this, but also asynchronously. So if you're using the Delphi technique or a series of touch points to build consensus, to create position statements, to work on documents and actual tool creation, so you can work with the brins of the world on creating things new and then disseminating the ideas, that's exactly what the Impetus Insight platform does. So let us know if you're interested in working with us and Bryn or other stakeholders. So thank you again for everybody for your attention, your time. Please like this video and share it so other people can find this information as well. Um, we appreciate uh, you Bryn for fantastic ideas and the work that you're doing and wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead.